In our last video, we looked at the fact that God is three persons, not one person who plays three roles, because we saw that these three persons, especially the Father and the Son, they interact. And we are going to look today at continue interaction between these two persons and the fact that, that well, the God the Son, Jesus, is going to refer to them as us something that they share together. I'm Pastor Tim Holscher. We are looking at, we're trying to answer the question, who is God? Looking at the biblical revelation, and we've been seeing that the, the biblical revelation clearly defines from the Old Testament that God is one, and at the same time, the Old Testament also demonstrates that there are three who all share the title that is God and share the title that is uh, Yahweh. We come over here to John chapter 17, 1, where we kind of pick up where we left off yesterday with this interaction between the Father and the Son, and Jesus is praying, and he says, spoke these things, lifting up his eyes to heaven, he, referring to Jesus, said, Father. Now, he's not talking to himself. He's talking to a completely another, a different person. They're both one God, but they are two persons. Father, the hour has come to glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you even as you gave him authority over all flesh, and to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So it's talking about one of the things that, that within the plan of God that was set was that they agreed that the Father was going to pass authority to the Son. And when he's doing this, it's going to be authority that well, as God he would have, but he's going to be the person. It's not going to be the Father doing this. It's going to be the, the Son doing this. And as we've said this before, there's three persons, and they're not the three stooges all trying to do the same job at the same time. They each play a different role in their in accomplishing their purpose. And then he goes on, explains what eternal life is. It has to do with experientially knowing God, but we know it only insofar as uh, as you can know it as man, so he mentions Jesus Christ refers to himself as Jesus Christ here, switching from the title son. If he used the title son, he'd be referring to his deity, he'd be referring to himself as God. But he uses Jesus Christ because we can only know God in terms of what a, a person could potentially, a human being could know, because we're not God. Verse 4, I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So the Father, when the Son came down here and became man, he submitted to the Father. It's a very big theme in the Gospel of John that he was doing the will of the Father, but also that he was capable of doing that. He says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, which, verse 5 is very important, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In other words, there was a glory that the Father and the Son shared in eternity past, before they had created anything. And remember, John 1 opens with the fact that the Word, being the Son, is God, calls him that, point blank, he's God, and also says that everything that ever came to be, came to be through him. Meaning, if he came to be, if the Son came to be, if he, if there was a point in time that he didn't exist and the Father created the Son, then he would have actually had to create himself. And, and John 1, 3 doesn't allow that. The Son is, the, is responsible for the existence of everything that has ever had a point in time because that was his role within these three persons was he was going to cause all things to exist. But there was a glory. So there was a point in time in which nothing existed except the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And at that time, the Son shared a glory with the Father. Then, advance about 2,000 years ago from our point of view, when the Son came down here and became human, became flesh, as we read in John 1.14. And he gives up, shall we say, the... Um, the uh, I'm just trying to think of a good way to put this, pardon me, but he gave up his his own initiative in using his will. He was always from that point, or from using his glory, pardon me, from that point on, he was only going to manifest his glory when that was what the Father wanted. He was going to submit in the realm, of, as, a, as a man, he was going to always submit to the will of the Father. And so you have that in John 2, when he does his miracle of changing the water to wine, he is showing forth his glory. What glory? Well, it's this glory, the glory that belongs to the Father and the Son. And by the way, the Old Testament, God says, I won't give my glory to anybody else. 
therefore, when he talks about this, we, it's a it's a good place for us to be reminded that the that the Son and the Father shared this glory. Um, so let's go on down here in the context. Um, oh, we're going to switch over here in John 17, verse 21. And he's talking now about us, something he wants for the believers. And he's looking at these 11 disciples, but he's looking out to the future. And he says that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. This is interesting because this is a very comparable relationship to what he indicates for us in John 14, 20 with him. But this is this is a way of saying the father and the, and the father and the son are one but they still remain distinct persons because they interpenetrate one another for with lack of a better expression so you father are in me and i in you again this isn't one person that's just talking to himself as this one individual told me no we're talking about two persons both are called god in john both are equal and He's talking to the Father in this regard, that they also may be in us. He wants them to be in us. He doesn't say in me. He says in us. Why us? Because the Father and the Son are two. And we saw this. We saw this the other day in the Old Testament, that there was an expression about us, and it's applied to the to the Spirit, and it's applied to the Son. And we saw, we saw God using the, the, the term or the pronoun us way back over in the book of Genesis, and in giving then a hint, giving a hint then that, well, that there was more than one person there. The Jews have, in the years since the advent of Christianity, they have come to try to reinterpret the us in some sense. It's like a plural of majesty. But again, um, that is not the normal way to understand that. And you do have, just read the, all of the Bible, the Old Testament included, you can clearly see one God and you can see these three persons. But here he's saying that they might be in us. This is what he was looking for. And I thought well, I had one more here, but I miss, I'm missing it. I guess maybe it was just the one there that I had today um, on this. There are several over here in John 17 it, where he kind of, you can see this interplay between the Father and the Son. All of this to say today again, just trying to, to, to give us one more opportunity to see that the Father and Son are two distinct persons. The Son is not the one God who is playing the role of the Father at times. No, he is one person who is interacting with another person who is the Father, and at other times interacts with another person who is the Spirit. And it's important for us to understand these three persons and what they are doing as what we call theologically the Trinity or the three in oneness, because that's the biblical truth. And as we've said before, that biblical truth is one of the reasons then that the work that Christ did on the cross is given value and the reason that it is saving. And if we find ourselves denying this or disagreeing, saying God is not three in one, there's just one that is God, well then the person that died on the cross their death is not enough, and you should be working for your salvation. But then we are left with all kinds of other questions like, well, how many works is enough? And we're not even going to go down that path because that's not a part of our study today. But we can thank God for the fact that the person that came down here and became a man is a person who is fully God, fully equal with the Father. And he willingly, not by force, not with his arm behind his back, willingly came down here and became like one of us so that he could die in our place on a cross, so that we could have salvation. As we saw over there in John 20, the church of God, which he, God, purchased with his own blood. That's the person of God, the Son. Worship him for this. Worship him for this unique character, this thing that sets him apart from anything else in creation, because there's nothing else in creation like this. And worship him for this and what it secures for us in our salvation and in our relationship with him. And therefore, I encourage you to have a good day in the Lord. And I want to thank you as always for joining me today.